David here with Fig Boot on Pens. Uh, last weekend, I had the pleasure of attending the DC Pen Show, and it was quite the experience. Um, you know, actually, before I get started on the show, um, I mentioned this in my, in my last video, but uh, behind me, I typically have a bunch of magnets on my desk. Uh, mainly, there's places that I visited or, or things that I like. Um, for example, I have one here of Van Gogh's irises, which reminds me of the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Um, or here's one of a very special place, uh, and I use special in quotes. It's a, a Mexican restaurant in Denver, Colorado called Casa Bonita. Uh, Casa Bonita is an eating experience like no other, and the food is truly, truly heinous. Uh, if you know of it, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, or I have things like uh, postcards, uh, you know, friends have sent like uh, this one uh, with some cool Japanese artwork on it. So um, if you wanted to send me a postcard or a magnet or anything else fun, uh, I have a P.O. box listed in the notes below. During my next Q&A, uh, I might have a mail time segment. So if you send me something, chances are good that I'll open it and, uh, and show it on camera. So um, back to the show. Uh, that in regard to the DC show, what I was going to do is talk a little bit about the show in general uh, and then show you some of the things I picked up. Um, the one pen I picked up in particular I'm very excited about. Uh, DC is about a four and a half hour drive from the Raleigh-Durham area, so as long as the traffic behaves, it's not too bad of a drive. Uh, this year, the rest of the family came with me on the trip. Uh, they had no interest in the show whatsoever. Uh, they just used me for a taxi service to get them up to DC. Uh, they used the weekend to go to a fancy high tea and check out some museums, and uh, uh, they did humor me by letting the, me walk them around the show for a few minutes on one of the days and introduce them to some friends. Uh, the show uh, was at a new venue this year in Falls Church, Virginia, about 15 minutes from the Capital District. Um, you know, it was funny. I have a friend from my local pen club who went to the show and actually ended up staying at the old hotel. She did that on purpose. She was just staying there. Uh, and she posted a funny picture on Instagram of her sitting in the large atrium area that in years past was packed with tables. Uh, but it was just empty. It just looked rather odd. Uh, the show got off to a bit of a rough start on Friday morning. You know, I arrived at about 9 a.m. and walked right into what I could only describe as utter chaos. Um, the organizers, to put it mildly, weren't very organized. Uh, and the vendors really bore the brunt of it. Um, the vendors weren't allowed into the main room until they were assigned their tables, but the table assignments were being kept secret, or no one had them, or there was lots of confusion. Uh, and vendors were only being let in a few at a time, and they were growing increasingly frustrated, and rightfully so. Uh, they were waiting out there for literally three and four hours before they, uh, uh, before they got their tables. Some vendors didn't get their tables until noon, and they were expecting to be set up at 8 a.m. So every minute or every minute uh, waiting around was, that was that much less that they had time to sell products. Uh, and there were attendees who just left because they couldn't get into the show. And, and there were a number of vendors who left as well demanding refunds. It really wasn't a good situation. You know, I like to stay positive, but, um, you know, I'm not going to delve on this topic for too long, but there's, you know, a lot that the organizers uh, did that, uh, you know, in my opinion, could have uh, done better and they could have done better to improve things, you know, but um, the main organizer kind of seems a little unwilling to accept help. Uh, you know, for example, on the show's website, there's a bit of information about the show, but there is no hours listed whatsoever. So no one in the building even know when the, knew when the show was technically supposed to start or end every single day. There was a lot of things like that going on. But after an extended wait of several hours, all the vendors were given their table assignments, but it, it kind of really put a damper on the day. And, and most of the vendors were in a pretty surly mood for the majority of Friday. Um, I will say, though, that Saturday, uh, the events of Friday had, had been forgotten, and, and it was a very busy day for all. Um, all the vendors I spoke with were very, very pleased with the turnout and the amount of business. Um, there were three main areas of the show. Um, there was a very large main room, which, um, if you've been to the DC show, was smaller than the main room at the other hotel. And uh, there was a decent size, or decent buzz in that room for most of the weekend. 
Um, the aisles were a little bit small, though, which became a major issue in the second, smaller room. Um, right as you entered, there was Canalia Pen Company on one side, as well as Chatterley Luxuries on the other. Uh, when you had one person deep at each table, then there was only room for one person to pass between them, which led to some pretty bad traffic jams in that room. Um, there was also a, a hallway that had a large number of vendors. Um, and that area wasn't so bad, but there was a back hallway that was really tight for space. Um, there was a couple of vendors who were initially assigned back there who, who basically demanded to be moved, simply because there wasn't enough space for them to set up their tables and work comfortably. You know, pen shows are social events, and it was really great to see a bunch of old friends as well as make lots of new ones. Um, I had lots of viewers stop uh, and say hi, uh, and I really appreciate that. I, I enjoyed meeting everyone um, that I was able to speak with. Uh, Stephen Brown and his wife Aziza were there, and it was really nice to be able to spend uh, time with them throughout the weekend. Um, here's a picture of Stephen and I with Brian Goulet of Goulet Pens. Uh, Stephen's suit was quite the sight to behold. Uh, I, I thought he looked a lot like a, a David Oscarson pen. Uh, and then here's Andy Lambro working hard to sell a pen. Uh, Andy's a great guy who uh, also happens to have a company that makes some amazing pens. Uh, you know, I, I've decided that in this video, I wasn't necessarily going to rattle through a bunch of names and give out a bunch of shout outs. But rest assured, if there was someone you wanted to meet at, a, at the pen or in the pen or stationary world, chances are pretty good that they were at this show. Tons of vendors, lots of bloggers and other content creators. Uh, and in addition, most of the prominent repair and tuning experts were in attendance as well. So there were plenty to choose from if you uh, had a special grind you wanted or a pen that you needed worked on. Uh, on Saturday night, Kenro sponsored an outing for a few of us at Top Golf, which turned out to be a lot of fun. Now, I love golf, but I wasn't sure how some of the other pen folks felt about hitting some balls. But we had a blast, uh, and it was really nice to spend time with folks outside of the hotel and outside of the show. Uh, it was also really nice to make some new friends. Uh, you know, a bit of news I learned at the show, uh, Nakaya has temporarily stopped taking orders for their dorsal fin models. Uh, this was what one looks like. Um, apparently the wait list was over a year to receive one of these, and rather than having people wait that long, they're just not going to take any additional orders for these until the wait is shorter. Uh, it was kind of funny because I had ordered this dorsal fin 2 late last year and was anticipating it to arrive close to my birthday, which is in November of 2017. Um, but rather than uh, waiting, the wait being a year, uh, it showed up in February, so I only had to wait two months. So I'm wondering if someone possibly canceled an order and I was just the beneficiary of that. Um, anyways, it is a wonderful pen uh, that I will need to review uh, sooner rather than later, but uh, it's just strikingly beautiful. And uh, I hope they're able to produce these, um, or well, they're producing them now, but I hope people will be able to order more at a later point in time because it is something worthwhile. Something very cool uh, making its DC show debut was the Pay It Forward table. Uh, Denise and Oscar did a great job of putting uh, this together uh, and putting the project together. They wanted to create an opportunity for folks to give back to the fountain pen community. So the idea of having the table was to have a place where every single thing on it was free for anyone to take. Uh, they raised some money via donations to actually pay for the table and uh, I think purchase a few supplies. I, it was funny because while they were giving away tons of stuff, they were actually receiving uh, so many donations as the show went on that it was tough for them to give everything away. Their inventory kept getting larger rather than smaller. Uh, my donation was a, a big thousand piece fountain pen puzzle. Someone had given it to me and I wanted to pass it on to uh, someone else who would appreciate it. Uh, they had these really cool fountain pen starter kits they were giving away to folks. Uh, this was one that someone in my family had picked up. Uh, actually, I haven't looked inside of this. I thought I'd do show so here uh, on this video so uh, we could find out together what was inside of it. So inside looks like there was maybe a little information about the project and uh, then maybe here's some of the companies that donated items. And then, oh, it's funny, looks like there was a little extra piece of paper they had to add with more companies. Then there was a field notes. And then, 
looks like there is a Pelicano, a, P a Pelican Pelicano, which is a fun little pen, especially if you don't have one. Um, it's a good first pen to play around with. Uh, and then, let's see, looks like, yeah, it also came with a cartridge in here. Um, I know that one of the kids received a, uh, a Pilot Plumix in their box, and it had the appropriate proprietary Pilot cartridge in the box, so that was nice. But, let's see, is that it? Just some tissue paper, but that was it that was in this box. But from uh, everyone that I had uh, talked to, uh, that uh, I heard that the Pay It Forward table was an enormous success. Uh, it would be great to see that at every show and have a, a version of this table at every show out there. Um, one of the really cool things that I was able to do at the show was attend the Richard Bender Nib Workshop. Um, there was only 16 seats available, uh, and I knew that those would go fast. So I wanted to make sure that I signed up the moment the registration was available on Richard's website. Um, Sign-ups were at 9.30 a.m. on a Friday, and so I'm in my office at work hitting refresh on my computer, waiting for the page to update. And then just like 30 seconds before it was, the registration was going to open, two people came in my office with an issue just right before it was supposed to open. So, you know, I'm afraid that if I didn't sign up right away, I'd lose my, lose my place. So uh, my coworkers are trying to get me involved to solve a problem and I'm sitting there trying to help them, but uh, at the same time, uh, signing up for my workshop. Uh, you know, if you weren't fortunate enough to get a seat, uh, Richard does allow for others to watch the class and to ask questions, which is very nice of him. But the hands-on teaching was limited to those who actually paid for the class. And there was probably more people in the back viewing than actually participated in the class. Um, it was very much a hands-on class. You were provided um, the supplies, which was a couple of pens and then the tools that you needed. Um, and each of these pens had unique issues that were already presented to you. And then Richard went over how to remedy those issues. Uh, and then uh, Linda Kennedy and Brian Gray were there to help out with the class as well. Um, it was really nice to do some work on a pen and then have Richard or Linda or Brian just check your work to make sure you were doing everything correctly. Uh, I found Richard to be a very good teacher, very clear and concise, and, and I learned a great deal. Um, at a later point in time, if the scheduling works out, we're at the same show, uh, Richard might just sit down for an interview. I think it would be fascinating to sit down and uh, talk nib tuning with him. So we'll see if we can make that happen. On Saturday night, there was a very well attended memorial for Susan Worth. If you weren't familiar with Susan, uh, she was a well-known figure in the Fountain Bend Show circuit who had a very colorful personality. Uh, she unfortunately passed away earlier this year right after the show in Chicago. Um, it was very nice service uh, with lots of tears but also lots of laughter. Um, Susan is someone who will be greatly missed. Uh, the hotel had a really nice bar area that was a great area to congregate in the evenings. Uh, you know, one afternoon I spent some time in there talking with my friend Andreas, who is considering starting to do some video reviews of his own for the Spanish-speaking market, from which I understand uh, is rather underrepresented when it comes to video reviews. Okay, let's get to some show and tell. Um, first of all, whenever I'm at a show, I stock up on paper. Um, I use these Rhodia number 18 pads every single day at work as well as at home uh, and for my reviews, uh, my writing samples, so um, that uh, I always stock up on those. And then also I'll stock up on a few number 16 pads and I use these on a daily basis to write my to-do lists at home. And I'd rather just stock up at shows rather than paying shipping costs on paper. Um, some other paper items I acquired. Um, Vito from Story Supply was nice enough to give me some of their dot grid pocket notebooks. Uh, Story Supply is a very interesting company with a uh, charitable business model that I'll go into uh, more when I re review these notebooks in the future. But um, it's an interesting story and uh, some pretty nice notebooks as well. Then uh, Detlef Bittner uh, gave me these three sets of specialty embossed and debossed note cards. Um, these are very, very nice cards that I'll be reviewing at a later date. Um, I was talking with Detlef, who has a background in specialty printing, and the process and detail that goes into the, in the hand making of each of these cards and envelopes was very interesting. I'll discuss that in detail when I review these cards, but so look for that coming up in the future as well. But these are nice, very nice, high quality cards. And we'll probably be giving some of these away. Let's see here. I also picked up some ink. 
Um, actually, a bunch of ink. Uh, first of all, I actually I ran into two gentlemen from uh, Virginia, uh, Logan and Eric, and Logan gave me a sample of Pilot Blue Black ink. So that was nice of him. So thank you, Logan. Um, let's see here. Then I picked up some Robert Oster River of Fire, and you know what? Here, let's see. Uh, this is what that ink looks like. Um, it's kind of a blue-green that's heavier on green than it is on blue. Um, it's a really nice color. I have it in a couple pens right now, and uh, I'm liking it. And then, let's see, from, uh, Frank from Federalist Pens and Paper was nice enough to give me a bottle of their exclusive Robert Oster ink called Frankly Blue, which um, Oster created for Federalists, uh, which was one of, if not the very first retailer in the U.S. to carry the Oster line of inks. Uh, and this is what this blue looks like, which is kind of a, kind of a, a bluish green with more blue than green in it. Okay, so then also I picked up um, a bottle of Sailor Gentle, is it Grenade? And this is what this looks like, kind of a rather deep red. And then finally I picked up a couple bottles of Pilot Orochizuku ink. Um, first of all, I picked up the, I'm probably going to butcher this name, it's Murasaki Shikabu, which is a really nice lavender purple like this. Now, I like this ink coming out of the pen more than I do looking at it on this card here. It seems like it comes out a little bit darker um, coming out of pens, but this looks a little bit lighter. But so far, I'm really liking this ink. And then I also picked up a bottle of Konpeki since I recently finished a bottle of it. So I had to replace that. It's one of my favorite inks. Um, the overall price for Eroshizuku inks has actually come down uh, they typically sold for $28 in the past, but now they're only $20. Um, the reasoning behind the drop in price is that the bottles that they come in are no longer being hand blown, which results in lower production costs, and they've passed those savings on to customers, which is nice. You know, uh, they very well could have just reduced their production cost and kept the pricing the same in order to make a greater profit. But it was nice to see a drop in price on most light one, which is on what is uh, most likely one of my uh, favorite lines of inks. So, okay, now for the good stuff, the pens. Now, I won't be going over too much uh, on these pens, just kind of a quick look. And at some point, each of these will receive their own in-depth review. Uh, let's see, first of all, I have a new utility pen that I hadn't seen before that uh, is from Monteverde, and it is called the One Stutch Touch Stylus Nine Function Tool Pen, which is a bit of a mouthful, but this is what it looks like. Uh, there are actually four different rulers here. Um, there is a level, then there is a, a stylus here on the end, and then when you under, unscrew the end, underneath is a uh, Phillips head screwdriver, which you could flip around for a flat head, um, and that it's small enough to use for things like glasses. Um, the cap unscrews, and this is indeed a fountain pen. Um, so this is kind of interesting, and it retails for only around like $35 or something like that. So I have not actually inked this up yet to try it, but uh, it's something that's uh, interesting. Okay, um, next is a pen I picked up from Ryan Krusak. So you know it's something good. Um, since the Raleigh show, I've been wanting to pick up this pen, so it was on my shopping list for DC. Now, I chose this wrap here made by Ryan's daughters because uh, inside is a map. I'm not sure how well you can kind of see that, but inside is a map, which I thought was appropriate for this pen, which is one of his Legend 16 Dangers of the Deep in Scrimshaw. You know, I was really debating between a couple of designs. There was one with uh, Poseidon fighting off a Kraken, and there was another of a whaling ship and a whale. Um, then there was this one. I know you can't see it too great, but it's a, a Kraken attacking a ship. So I thought this was just some cool imagery on a very nice pen. Uh, this barrel is moose antler, and you know what? I'm not quite sure what wood this is. It's not the ebony, and I think it's too dark to be the Coco Bolo, uh, but uh, it's one of the, th uh, the first things I picked up on Friday morning because I didn't want it to disappear. So I didn't ask too many questions when I bought it. I'll have to touch base with Ryan uh, later on to find out what wood this is. He uses some very cool exotic materials. 
um, that if you'd like to learn more about Ryan and his uh, very good work, uh, please make sure to check out my interview with him from a couple of months back. He's a very talented artist and, uh, and very interesting to speak with. Okay, next I picked up something from Edison Pens, and that is a Herald. Um, this was my impulse purchase of the show. It wasn't on my shopping list, but when I was visiting with Brian and, and Andrea Gray, um, I caught this caught my eye. Um, I've been into oranges lately, and I really like this material. Um, Edison has always been one of the best looking tables at a show. Um, just the wide variety of colors and materials and the manner in which they're displayed, they really show off the product well. But in regard to this Herald, um, so far I'm really liking this pen. Uh, I think it looks cool, it writes fantastic, uh, and if you don't own an Edison, their site is well worth checking out. Uh, plus, the Greys are really nice people. Okay, next we have something very special which comes in this very distinctive box, and that is a pen from the Canalea Pen Company. Now, they have a new model they just recently released that I wanted to check out, but I didn't pick that one up. I picked up one of their previous models, which is the Kilauea, and this is what it looks like. Um, that it represents the flowing lava of the Kilauea volcano on the big island of Hawaii. Um, this is the inspiration picture behind the pen. So you can see uh, that it kind of matches in the, uh, the reddish orange and, and the black. Now, I've been to um, uh, Hawaii and took a helicopter tour over the Kilauea volcano, uh, and I saw the lava flows just like those, and it was an amazing experience. Um, and, and I wanted a pen that kind of reminded me of that. Um, one of the cool things about a Kanalea pen is that no two pens are alike. The acrylics are hand mixed by Jonathan Brooks and the material is truly spectacular. Uh, you know, previous versions of this pen I had seen online and it shows had a little bit more black than orange and I just didn't personally care for that look as much. I mean, it still looked amazing, but I kind of wanted one with more orangish red and when I saw this one, I just couldn't pass it up. Now, this section right here, the reds and oranges and yellows and blacks, all with a touch of pearlescence, you know, as soon as I saw that little stretch right there, I was sold. You know, Hugh and Carol launched the Canalea Pen Company at last year's DC show, and in just one short year, they've made a significant impact on the fountain pen world. The combination of Jonathan Brooks' materials and Hughes' craftsmanship create a spectacular and unique product. Um, there's really nothing else like it out there on the market today that I am aware of. I, I just love it. Um, in addition, just like the Grays, Hugh and Carol, as well as Jonathan Brooks and his wife Shay, are really great folks that I enjoy hanging out with. They're just good people. Okay, one last pen, and it's something brand new. And it's something that, in my opinion, is truly, truly special. And that is the Armani Simone Club Bologna Extra Arco. And this is what it looks like. Now, there's a lot of information of this on this pen and how it came to be, and I'll save that for the full review, but just know that the condensed story is that after Omas went out of business uh, about a year and a half ago, a company purchased their existing inventory and raw materials. And these are the same folks who helped revive Wall Eversharp and produce their excellent deco band line. And you can see a deco band influence in this pen. First of all, it's a made from the Omas Ar Arco celluloid stock, which in my opinion is just amazing. Um, I had pre-ordered this about six months ago at the Atlanta show, sight unseen. I just saw a picture of it uh, and, and ordered the pen, uh, kind of on faith. It was um, cool because they had about 10 of these at the show in DC, and I was able to kind of take my pick of the bunch because um, I was kind of one of the first ones to get their pens for the day. Uh, the Arco on each is slightly different, and I was able to pick the number I wanted, which was nice, and it worked out that the one I felt had the best looks kind of on the front here uh, was the one that had a number that I liked, so that worked out well. But take a look at this nib. Um, this is what is called their Magic Flex nib, and it's very similar to the one on the Wall Eversharp Deco Band, but I, I find this one to be a bit more firm, and while I like 
the nib on the deco band, uh, I really like this one even more. Um, it has a Chilton filling system uh, and it is very heavy. Uh, this pen has a great deal of heft. Um, so far, I'm really just loving this pen. Um, that I have a strong feeling you might just be seeing this pen very high on a top 10 list later this year. Oh, um, something cool. While at their booth picking up this pen, they had some scrap Arco material on their display. Uh, some small blocks and some shavings that were on display for looks. Uh, and Manu and Sarah with ASC were nice enough to actually give me a piece of Arco. And here it is. Now, this is just a little, you know, one inch square, well, rectangle uh, piece of material. But there's just something about this little thing that brings me joy. You know, first of all, it's rare. Uh, this celluloid is currently not produced anywhere in the world. You know, I've been told there's enough material for about 400 of these Bologna pens. Uh, and then this Arco will be no longer. It's just not going to be in existence. Um, it, it's just like a little piece of history. And it's funny because for the rest of the show, I, I would, you know, people would ask, you know, what you bought and things like that. And I would show some pens, but then I would show this little piece of Arco to people and their eyes would just light up and they would get a big smile on their face. Uh, there's just something special about this Arco. Uh, when I showed this to Brian Gray of Edison, he actually offered to uh, polish this up for me. So after I'm through with this video, I'm going to take him up on that offer and, uh, and ship this little square piece off to Ohio for him to polish up. I think it'll look even cooler. Plus, having Brian work on it adds to the story. So those were my purchases. Uh, you know, I mentioned this last year during my DC show recap, but whenever I'm in DC, there's something I always make time to do. Um, I like to visit the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, it's just one of my favorite spots in the area. Uh, they have a mark on the ground to commemorate the spot where Dr. Martin Luther King gave his famous speech. You know, I'll typically look out and imagine what it might have been to be there on that historic day. Uh, then I kind of make my way over to the Vietnam Memorial. It's about 200 yards away from the Lincoln Memorial, but it's a bit more calm and quiet over there. Uh, you know, I didn't know anyone who gave their life in the war, but there's someone on the wall that I go to see. Uh, it's someone with my exact name, first, middle, and last. Uh, they passed away pretty close to the day I was born. And, you know, I know where the name is on the wall, but each time I, I go to these reference books and, and they have them listing the location of uh, each name on the wall. Then I have to walk the length of the wall because my namesake is kind of close to the far end uh, in order to find him. Uh, Army Staff Sergeant David Allen Parker was a Special Forces medic from San Angelo, Texas, who volunteered for an eight-man surveillance mission during the spring of 1968 and it cost him his life. So I think it's the least I can do to uh, stop by every so often and pay him a visit. So uh, that was a recap of my experience at the DC Pen Show this year. Overall, I had a lot of fun. Um, after the hiccups on Friday, it was really a great show. Um, sometimes shows can be a bit draining, but for the most part, I just had a big smile on my face for most of the weekend. It was a great time. I'd highly encourage you to check out the DC show if you're ever thinking about attending, or check out a, a smaller show closer to where you live. It's typically a very, very good experience. So, thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you later.